good to see you here. But what a beautiful morning it is. A little crisp air, a little sunshine, reminds us we're alive. We had a good day yesterday on the project. Um, such a good day, in fact, I had a lost and found. So if you're missing drill bits and or a coffee cup, let me know. And if nobody lets me know, we'll be putting it on eBay to raise funds for the church. <laughs> Um, interesting time uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about a subject that uh, uh, can be kind of controversial, but let me set it up by saying this out of Psalm 53. Fools say in their hearts there is no God. They are corrupt and their ways are vile. There is no one who does good. That sounds like bad news, but keep reading. God looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there are any who understand and who seek God. That's why I wanted to look down this morning and see if words are those who seek God, who attempt to understand. So as we attempt to do that, will you stand and worship with us this morning?
praise a God who's here, whose presence is in this place. Praise a God of hope.
full of Lord and prayer for you, Lord. We know heaven come down. We celebrate you, your presence in this place. We celebrate that hope. And God, we, we remember that you offered that to us. You don't wait for us to get right. You offer that now. You offer your forgiveness, your grace now. You offer that presence now.
nama jiwa hidup. That's a good thing. Um, my name is John. I'm one of the pastors here and want to invite you to fill out our connection card, which you can scan on the screens with the uh, QR code or on the door. There's a sign. You have to go outside to do it. But um, please let us know that you are here worshiping with us and online. The link will be there soon. So as soon as I get done here, I'll post that link for you. Um, but uh, you can also submit a request through that or let us know anything that we need to know. About what's going on in your life, and um, we would be happy to receive those. At this time, we're going to ask our kiddos to go with Miss Barbara and Miss Erica. So they're right over here next to the side doors, and if you guys want to head that way, you'll have a great time. And parents, we are doing communion today, so the kids will come back to join us for communion. So um, kids are always, always welcome in communion here in this church. All righty. So we've got a couple things happening today. One is our food box drop-off. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everybody who's brought that. We are doing uh, food boxes for seniors, uh, senior citizens. There's about 70 in our local community who are um, not, not doing great in terms of getting enough food. And so we are helping uh, the First Methodist Church. We're partnering with them to do this project. And so the first Sunday of every month, starting today, we're bringing uh, food items. And you can look online to find out uh, what are some good food items to bring for these boxes. And then uh, later today, we've got our Dangers of the Internet, our Internet Safety Seminar, put on by Houston Police Department. That is 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. here in this room. You won't want to miss it. We're inviting all of our youth to it as well as any adult. So whether you're a parent, grandparent, or uncle, aunt, um, distant cousin, anything, anybody's welcome, uh, age appropriate, high school and above, right? Um, and some, some uh, junior high students are coming maybe. Um, thank you to the men's group who did the work day yesterday. We had a question behind um, the, the curtain over here is the, the lost and found. Did you have to be there in order to claim that? Is that a, not necessarily. Okay. Um, but thanks for continuing the work of compassion here. Um, this was done by our men's group. So if you are not part of a community group and are interested, uh, please uh, talk with Pastor Bill about getting connected to the community group. And um, it's just a great opportunity to grow spiritually with some other folks. And then lastly, I know that we are coming up on our uh, one-year mark of our two-week lockdown. So with that, I know that the, the gov governor has said, you know, institutions are free to choose how they want to deal with the masks. Um, we are requesting that everybody continue to wear masks. Um, it's not a big deal. Um, uh, the bishop has sent us a video, all the churches in the conference saying, hey, please encourage your churches to do this. But even aside from that, we think it's uh, smart and wise to do that. So hopefully, hopefully, in a matter of months, we'll be done with this. Amen? Amen. Uh, more people are getting um, vaccinated and uh, coming through, having had it, and these sorts of things. So hopefully... We're just around the corner for that. All right. And if you have any questions about that, please um, don't come to me. Go to Bill. 
And uh, there you go. He's like, you're throwing me under the, under the rug today a lot. Um, but anyway, continue to pray for all those being affected by COVID. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks. Lord, it is a strange year, and we're heading into the second year of this weirdness. Lord, we uh, thank you that no powers on this earth or in this earth or swarming around us can keep us from worshiping you, from serving you, from loving you, from knowing you. And so, Lord, we just want to honor our hearts and tents. We came out here this morning, Lord, to hear your word and to worship you. So meet us, greet us, and allow us to experience the transforming power of your grace. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' holy and precious name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, Lord, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Lord, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> How's everybody doing this morning? Good. 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 We are continuing our sermon series called The Epic of Eden. And if you have not been a part of a study, I would encourage you to look into that because it is uh, one of those studies that gets in your head, uh, turns you about 90 degrees, and makes you look at things all anew. And if you don't believe me, ask some of the people in the small groups. And if you haven't had that experience, I would love to hear from you because uh, I have a feeling that we've missed somewhere. And I'd like to help you find that. The Epic of Eden is going to run on here for uh, up until and through Easter. And this morning we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the story of Noah. Now, I say that earlier in the, the conversation, I said that this can be kind of a controversial topic. You say, well, what's so controversial about it? I mean... You know, it's a pretty straightforward story. We paint our kids' nurseries with the little murals and the ark and, and all that stuff. And we make memes about, you know, the dinosaurs that were watching the ark and go, oh, was that today? And, and, and then that's why they're not here. Um, so, or famous sayings like, uh, if you are uh, the third monkey in line on the ark, you better fight like everything. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that today, and you say, well, I don't see why that's controversial. You will. Uh, bear with me. But here's what I've learned. In, in trying to deal with the understanding of God, trying to be a Jesus follower, here's what I've learned. Context is everything. Context is everything. For example, there's a sale on today. Well, that depends on what's on the for sale. If it's uh, down at the mall, uh, that's a place where we used to go, and there were shops and people all over. Um, you could buy anything you want. This is great. Uh, their shoes are on sale. Uh, that would make my wife very happy uh, and me very sad because I think we're going to need a bigger closet. Um, uh, that, that's a good thing, right? Um, but there are other things for sale. And context is everything. There are arms for sale. You want to be a warlord? Just go to the right country. There are drugs for sale. Some of those are life-giving. Some of those are life-taking. And it's about to get heavy here for just a second. There's kids for sale. So context is everything. I was listening to a podcast this week. Uh, it was an Australian journalist that was interviewed. She spent a lot of time in Iraq during the time when ISIS was actually taking territory. And she witnessed uh, the Iraq, or excuse me, the ISIS treatment of the Yazidi people who literally had kids for sale at eight years old. And I won't go into great detail because it's not, uh, not appropriate to do so here. But, uh, and I won't even tell you the name of the book that she wrote about it because I think it's just so disturbing the way that people can treat each other. So context is everything. And, and one of the things that they said that, that they interviewed these Yazidi women said, you know, they used to be our neighbors and they are Yazidi, but they became ISIS. Now, you might be asking yourself, how could you possibly do that to your neighbor? Let me just say context is everything. I've never been through what they've been through. I've never been through the pressures that they're under. I've never been through trying to fight for just another day of survival. I don't know what that's like. I don't know what I'd do. I bet you don't know what you'd do either. You, you think you might know what you'd do. The context literally is everything. Or I can tell you about, uh, I'll, I'll call him Dr. A because I can't pronounce his last name. Uh, I sure can't spell it. Uh, has harvested organs 
on the bound for sale. Uh, so far, Dr. A has probably harvested over 800 organs and, and is still going today. Let that sink in for just a second. The context being everything, let me let me get a, a Oh, that's the Yazidi people. I was supposed to, to point to them. They're actually migrating, being forced out. But here's, a, here's another story that's a little lighter, and, and we'll take it a little bit easier here. Now, how many people have read Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? He tells a great story about context. He tells the story of a man sitting on a subway, and uh, he, Dr. Covey is sitting across from him, and the man's sitting there with three kids, and three kids are getting a little rambunctious. They're running all over the subway train, and, and Cubby's thinking to himself, come on, man, get your kids under control. And he doesn't say much. They're just being a little rambunctious. But then they start to, where they're actually getting dangerous. Like they're near the stairs. They're running up and down. The train may stop. And so finally he goes over to the man and says, hey, sir, uh, could you get your kids under control? And the man's response was, oh, yeah, sorry, we're just coming from the hospital there. Uh, their mother died, and uh, yeah, I'm trying to get my head around that. <laughs> so Dr. Covey immediately went from judgmental to sympathetic. Why? Because context is everything. Are you getting to the point that <laughs> context is important? So <clears throat> that's what we want to talk a little bit about today. This this context is king when it comes to trying to understand Bible stories and know it is no different. You've probably experienced some of this context issue, and it generally involves you have a piece of information, but you don't have the whole of the information. For example, has your child ever come home from school uh, with a note from a teacher? Do they do notes from teachers anymore? Or is it a text? I don't, I don't know. I'm looking at Gwen. Right? <laughs> and, and you're thinking, oh, my child is, oh, and then you get the rest of the story, right? Or maybe it worked the other way, where your child told you something, and you're like, Oh, that school, and then you go to the school and you get the rest of the story like that. <laughs> okay, so you, you get the rest of the context. If you've been in any relationship, you, you know what it is to have part of the story and not all of the story. And we live in a world where, we, quite frankly, we don't rarely, we, we rarely get all of the story. Uh, I think that's becoming more and more the norm. So what does this all have to do with what we're talking about today? Well, context matters. When it comes to trying to understand God, how many people are familiar with this, this uh, story where you, you have all these people looking at an elephant, but they're only looking at one specific piece of the element, and they're asked to describe the elephant. And they say, one says, well, it's like a, like a rope. The other says, no, 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 it's not a rope at all. It's hard like bone. It's, it's really hard. The other one says, no, 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 it's big and round and kind of soft. And what they're doing is they're each looking at a little piece of the elephant. And if you listen to their stories, they're describing something completely different. But when you step back far enough and you see the whole thing, they're all describing the elephant. They're just describing different parts of the elephant. Somehow I think uh, that's what we do with God a lot of times. We see a piece of God, but we never step back to see the wholeness of God. And so sometimes God puzzles us. Noah is, I think, one of those stories when it comes to my mind because we treat it like a kid's story. And if you're going through the study, you, you, if you haven't heard it yet, you will hear Dr. Richter say, uh, you know, we paint murals on our walls. We have cute songs that we sing in Vacation Bible School. They have play sets uh, where you can do the ark and everything. But if you think about the real story of Noah, it's like the picture on the right. It's a picture of death and destruction, total devastation across the, the, where the area that it is flooded. So how is it that God could do that? And, and this was one of the questions that came up in our group. Why would God wipe out everybody except for Noah and his family? What about all those innocent people out there? Well, let me tell you, that's a great question. Why would a loving God do that? Have you ever wondered that? I have. In fact, I still do sometimes. But let's put it into a little bit of context. And as we go through this little exercise, uh, let me tell you that this is Bill Hogan. You don't have to agree with me, but I'm going to plant some seeds that I want you to investigate on your own. I want you to arrive at your own decision about how to handle uh, when God doesn't make sense. So I'll be reading out of uh, Genesis chapter 6, <clears throat> verses 5 through 8. And as I prepare to read that, or you prepare to find that, 
uh, just remember that part of what we've been talking about is God's blessings and curses. And the deal is, the way that God works in the Old Testament, he makes a covenant. And he says, okay, here's the deal. Now, if you do this and you obey, here are the blessings you will receive. However, if you don't do this and you disobey, here's the curse that will follow. So let's take it into that context as we read Genesis 6, 5 through 8. This is much after Adam and Eve have been cast out of the garden. Uh, civilization has had time to progress. It's questionable in what direction it's progressing, but it has progressed. And this is where we're at. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the words of God, they are for the people of God, and for these words we are grateful. Amen. Because they tell us a story, a story that we shouldn't forget too soon. When we talk about blessings and curses, we talk about the, the ability to obey gets blessing, the disobedience gets the curse. This is a fascinating look at God to me, because the entire human race, except for Noah and, and his family, basically disobeying. So you see the blessings that were become the curse. The very thing that should have blessed them becomes the curse. You think about some of the, the analogies here. In creation, we're going to bounce back and forth between creation and Noah. In creation, God made and then said it was good. And then at the end, it was, it was very good. Here he's saying it's evil. In fact, it's all evil. It's gone completely different. In the, in the beginning, when uh, Eve was first tempted, she saw the, the one fruit of the tree that she should not eat. She saw it, desired it, and took it and ate. If you read a little bit before this, which I always say reading in circles, I read a little bit here, but you read a little bit before, a little bit after, you will see that the, one of the reasons this is happening is it says the sons of God saw and desired the daughters of man and took them to be wed. Now, we could go into great discussions on what exactly that means, but here's my general rule, because no one really knows what that means. You can go to any Bible scholar you want, find another one that will disagree with them. Here's what I look for. Rather than exactly what does that mean, I look for the reaction to that thing. The reaction to the fact that the sons of God took, saw and took the, the daughters of men is that God thought that they were so corrupt that they needed to be wiped out. I don't know exactly what that means, but what it tells me is they were doing some serious wrong. And that, that's good enough for, for my purposes today. So what does God do? In the beginning, there was this void. There was a spirit hovering over it. The spirit, as we've talked about before, is the same word that means breath or wind. So the wind's hovering over the waters. And in the beginning, the land and the water are separated. And we get land and, and sea. And and from that, other things begin to happen, like animals, plants, things begin to grow. The human, Adam, is made to take care of all that stuff. And so now that was which was supposed to be the blessing is reversed. And what is now land and water teeming with animals and humans is going to once again become one. See how it's all working backwards? The water comes back over the land, wipes out all the living beings except for those on the ark. What was blessing is now curse. It's fascinating to me. As the ark begins to settle and it's time for them to land, but what happens? If you read the text in the, right here after the, the couple chapters after this, you see that the wind stirs and begins to separate water from land and the ark lands. As if God is saying, okay, we're going to try this one more time. So what I did, I created, I undid. Now I'm redoing. And we're going to try this one more time. And it's, it's fascinating. Two things fascinate me about the end of that whole story. One is that uh, the very first thing that Noah does when he gets off the ark. Does anybody remember this story? What's the first thing Noah does when he gets off the ark? 
He builds an altar. What do you do on the altar? You offer a sacrifice. Now, is sacrifice anything new to human beings? No. Now, go back and look at uh, Cain and Abel. In fact, <laughs> that's a whole other story about uh, how, how quickly it could go south. But here's what it was for. If you read the text, Noah made a sacrifice to atone for the sins, the sins of the people. See, that first sacrifice wasn't about sin. first sacrifice was about honoring God. This one is to atone for the sin of the people, this wickedness that is pervasive. That fascinates me. But here's the other thing. What's God's direction to Noah and his family? Anybody know? Be fruitful and multiply. Where have you heard that before? Right from the beginning. Be fruitful and multiply. So God literally is taking this as a do-over. Let's try this one more time. Now, in my mind, that makes God seem like kind of an knucklehead. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, why would loving God do that? If Why would he even create that if he knew that that was a possibility? Well, I would argue that God's plan is still good. And God still has faith in us. So what we need to do is we need to put this in context and look at what, what's God doing and why is God doing it. So as I look at God in this, the context is curse. He's not doing anything he, didn't, he, he said he wouldn't do. That didn't come out very well. He's not doing anything that he hadn't already promised. If you disobey, here's the curse. He told us up front. And I've told you before that why should we be mad at God if we knew that going in? If we know that disobedience is going to result in a curse, why would we be angry at a God that then enacts the curse? But if you're like me, that's not quite good enough. Because that's like when a parent says, I want you to do this. Why? Because I said so. It's just not satisfying, is it? Don't you want a little bit more than that? I do. So join me on this journey. Context is everything. Why would a loving God do this? Let me go back to Dr. A for just a second. Dr. A, <clears throat> whose last name I cannot pronounce, was my cancer doctor. And when I say he's harvested over 800 organs, he's harvested over 800 cancerous organs. Now, if you've ever been through this experience, you know what, you, you, well, maybe it's different for you, but when you hear that C word, it's like, ooh, you get pretty tense. Things get real, real quick. And he starts talking about options, and what Dr. A told me was, Okay, here's what I want to do with you. We think it's contained. I want to be super aggressive in your treatment because you're a young guy. I said, thanks, I'll pay you later. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, your definition of young may be different than mine, but I feel better already. He said, I want to be super aggressive on this. I mean, we could do, he named all the treatments that we could do. We could draw this out. And of course, in my mind, I'm still in that denial phase. I'm going, can I just like eat better and exercise more? He's like, no, 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 no. Here's what happens. If we don't do anything, there are cells inside you right now that are corrupt. And they are in the process of corrupting other cells. And if we don't do anything, it's not going to be contained anymore. It's going to do one of two things, because this is how it works. It's either going to jump onto the superhighway of your body called the lymph system and get in there, and then God knows where it's going to go. Or it's going to get into your bones, and that one's pretty tough to handle. So this is why I want to be super aggressive right now. I want to cut it out. I'm thinking, what are the other options, right? He wanted to be super aggressive because he wanted to catch that before he had a chance to replicate. And then, and this is what he said. He said, we can do nothing. We can try other things. But if we miss any of it, it will kill you. That gets your attention. It got my attention. So Dr. A, <clears throat> talking about being aggressive, what's his motive behind that? Is he mean? Is he enacting a curse? Does he just want to cut people open? Does he want to harvest organs? No, he wants to save lives. And, and yeah, he gets paid for it. I mean, granted, he, he makes a pretty good salary as a doctor. But he's got a good heart. And he was telling me about some of the people that he's helped. He does this because he wants to heal people. It makes a lot of sense. So here's, here's the thing. Take that with one person and one doctor to an entire civilization. The entire civilization has a cancer in it. And it is replicating itself to the point where the entire organism will die. The entire civilization will die. 
I don't think God created us because he wanted that to be the end result. I'm pretty sure God created us because he wanted a relationship with us. He created us for good, not for evil. We're the ones who chose that. So why would God allow choice? Go back and listen to a couple of weeks ago, or was it last week? I don't know. They all blend together. Or ask me. Buy me a cup of coffee. Buy me two cups of coffee. I'll talk about the whole Bible. Right? Really fast. All right? So God does not want to abandon us. But here, look at look at the state of affairs. I'm going to be reading uh, out of uh, Genesis 6, 5 again here. How great the wickedness of the human race. Listen to some of these words. Every inclination, not some, every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil. Not sometimes evil, only evil. When? All the time. Every only all those are pretty extreme terms and that's what God has seen and maybe God makes that decision that this is the time to cut out that cancer cancerous cell before it takes down the, the whole organism and we're going to try again I think God's plan is still good he picks one man who, who he find, in whom he finds favor this righteous man named Noah whose name ironically literally means rest God's plan is still good. <clears throat> How do I know this? Well, God has this desire. He still gives us choice because that's the only way that you can experience true love. You can't make someone love you. There was a famous song about that. I can't make you love me if you won't. I can't make your heart feel something it won't. Shall I go on? <laughs> no. I don't see the high sign in the back. All right. So... Here's the thing. We, we have to be able to choose to be able to truly love God. And when we choose God, that's true love. And why would we do that? Because God first chose us. That's God's love to us. So this new covenant gets made. There was a covenant with Adam. That didn't work out so well. We're going to try this one more time. There's a new covenant now made with Noah. We're going to start over. Thank you for that sacrifice for 20% now. Be fruitful and multiply and go forth. And there's one really cool sign that happens in the sky. It's a rainbow. Now, if you're in the study, uh, I'm not going to, this is the, no spoiler alert here. I'm not going to tell you this, the symbolism of that rainbow. But it's pretty cool once you know what that rainbow is because it's not just pretty colors. It's not just a leprechaun at the, at the end with a pot of gold. There's really cool symbolism behind the rainbow. And I'm going to leave that teaser because I want you to go back to your study groups and ask what's the symbolism behind the rainbow. And then if you're not in the study group, I want you to come up and ask me, hey, Bill, what's the symbolism behind the rainbow? Because it's just cool. Anyway, it's a promise that God will never do this again. Now, that sounds good. We're starting over. We've got a righteous man. God's never going to wipe out the earth like that. But here's what scares me about that. If the world should again choose to get so evil that our thoughts are only evil all the time, who's going to rescue us? God said he wouldn't do this again. See, this puts the impetus on us. It's up to us to combat evil. It's up to us to make better choices. And I'm not talking like make good choices. No, I'm like, like life, civilization, family, culture choices. Continually and not just once. It's up to us to overcome that evil, that violence, that senseless violence. How do I know this? Well, there was a guy called Jesus. And when Jesus came, he did many things. But the most amazing thing that he did, well, there's actually two amazing things he did. Jesus got baptized. Why would Jesus... Son of God, man who has never sinned, need to get baptized. You ever wondered that? What is the symbolism of baptism? We take the old, the corrupt, we take it under the water, where it is cleansed and renewed, and we die to self, and we are renewed, arisen, anew, clean, pure. Does that sound familiar? It's the story of Noah. And so Jesus is reenacting that whole process before everyone. And he even talks about how he has to be baptized because he has a baptism of fire that is awaiting him. And that fire is taking on the sins of the world that was only evil all the time. 
that's the bit of news that we have that helps us against maybe these people. They didn't know that. They didn't know the rest of the story. But then the next fascinating thing that Jesus does is as he is crucified on the cross on behalf of us for our sins, he rises again. Name any other great teacher that has done that. Let's pull that one off. Uh, the answer? No one. That's what makes him special. But here's the thing. He didn't just rise again and go, hey, look at me, I am so awesome. He rose and he continued to teach. And then as he was physically preparing to depart this earth, he gave us a great commission. And this was it. Anybody remember the great commission? It is to go make disciples of all the nations, teach them. Oops. Wrong one. Go make disciples of all the nations, teach them, and do what? Baptize them. What is baptism a symbolism of? That time when we were only evil all the time and God wiped out the earth to do it again, to give us another chance to get it right this time. So maybe God isn't mean. Maybe God is actually loving. Because maybe the most loving thing that he could have done at that time was to cut out that cancerous cell that would have spread to the entire organism and killed it. Maybe God gives us this great commission and his son called Jesus because he knows that we're not going to make the best choices all the time. And so Jesus takes on that sin for us and gives us a chance to renew in the moment, even after we've done something terrible, to say, I've done something terrible. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sin. Can I start over? And the answer is yes. So here's the thing. You may not agree that God is actually loving, but from my point of view, context is everything. Having seen only evil all the time, I've not seen that. I've seen good. I saw good yesterday. I see good here today. I see good on that table. I see good in how you live your lives. I've not seen only evil all the time, but God has. And God, in his infinite wisdom, decided that that was not good and needed to be dealt with. Maybe because he loved us and he wanted us to have a second chance. I'm not saying that you have to agree with me. I'm just planting seeds that I would like you to think about and arrive at your own decision. See, in my mind it boils down to this. We could be the cancer or we could be the cure. Context is king. And when your context is the king of kings, man, anything is possible. Will you pray with me, please? God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the context that we continue to build. And God, I pray that as we try to understand and uh, get our, our arms wrapped around the wholeness of who you are, that you would grant us grace and wisdom, that you would help us to see an operative uh, motive of love, that you would help us to recognize what has happened in the past, what the human race is capable of, and to take the Great Commission seriously, that we would go, that we would teach, that we would baptize, that we would make disciples. Because, God, the one way that we can overcome evil is through the spreading of love, grace, and truth. We're not equipped to do that, but because of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the forgiveness that is there, you have enabled us to do so. Now grant us the courage to follow through on the Great Commission and share your love and grace with the entire world so that at some point you might say, once again, it is good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Communion is a strange thing. Sometimes we think it's just about coming to church and having bread and juice and remembering what Jesus did for us. But for Jesus it, and the early disciples, it was a much bigger prospect. It was the gospel encapsulated in one event. And if you think about it, he invites us into his presence to come to his table and to share in his body and his blood and to consume that in a way that it makes us a different person and it sustains us in an ongoing way spiritually. And then we leave having been changed and go into the world to make a difference and to let other people know who Jesus is. 
But it's that one little bit that we often miss. In order to come to the table, we've got to go through surgery. Because we've got to deal with our sins before we can truly understand the fullness of what Jesus did for us. So this morning, as we go through this prayer and remembrance, and as we pass around the elements, let us focus on what's keeping us from God. You know, not the things like cars and jobs and things, but deep within our heart, those dusty corners we don't even want to mention to other people. What's keeping us from coming into the fullness of God's presence? On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and he broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took a cup filled with the fruit of the vine, and he gave thanks to the Father, gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Holy God, this morning we pray. We pray that you would so fill us with your Holy Spirit. Allow your Spirit to come down on this bread and this juice and make them be for us the body of Christ, in the blood of Christ, so that we may know the redemption that is promised to us. Lord, we ask these things in God's holy name, Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. Amen. As our kiddos are coming in, I know that uh, children are always welcome to take communion here. We believe that they will grow into a fuller understanding as they take it, uh, just like us. And so um, as I come around with the baskets, I'm going to hand you a cup, and um, uh, we will just hold on to it. We will partake of that together as a congregation, and um, we'll get started. Okay, as you have your chalice, the bottom part is actually the bread, and we will partake of that first. So go ahead and, and take off your seal. Go grab your wafer of bread. Hold that up. And then repeat after me. This is the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ. Broken for you. seal or take it all the way off. If you'll hold up your chalice and repeat after me. This is the blood of Christ. This is the blood of Christ. Shed for you. Shed for you. Holy God, we give you thanks for giving yourself for us, for allowing us to experience a true life and what it means to be renewed in your image, but Lord, also for transforming us in a way that helps us be better people and learn how to let go of our sins. So Lord, this morning, we just want to praise you for all that you are and all who you are and all who you've called us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
hope you would explore the Bible as a way to answer those, and I hope you will do them with people who are comfortable with your questions and your doubt, because God is big enough to handle both. If that's not you, if you don't have a place to do that, I encourage you to, to get with me. Let's connect you with some people, or I'll sit down and chat with you. But here's what I don't want us to do. I don't want us to take these Bible stories that we've heard as children and made into cute little songs and live life as, as, as if that's all there is. Because there's so much more on both ends of the spectrum. There's a God who is good. There's a God who has a plan. And his plan is still good. That's where I want to land at. So this morning, as you go forth from here, remember Jesus' final command to us. Go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Make disciples, teach, and baptize, so that the world may know he is who he says he is. In Jesus' name, amen.